thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art, thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping. the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace, in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So his covenant is blood, support me. Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. You may be seated.
All right, as everybody knows, it's time to go back to school. And those of you who are saying, well, I haven't been to school for years, you're still gonna have a year of learning. So I hope that you have all the things that you need for learning this year. First of all, glue. Everybody has your glue. And uh, that's to remind us to stick close to Jesus this year with prayer and reading your Bible. So hope everybody gets their glue out. Uh, let's see, we're also going to need some of these uh, colors. Gonna need colors to color your year bright and let the light of Jesus shine through you. So you're gonna need some, some colors, markers, pencil crayons, anything colorful. What else are you gonna need in your knapsack? A gratitude journal. This is where you actually write down the things that you have gratitude for. And a good rule of thumb is three a day. At the end of the day or the beginning of the day, write down three things that you are grateful for this school year. And of course, to do that, you're gonna need one of these writing implements. And to write his story in your life this year by doing what Jesus would do and making good choices. Okay, so that's, that's what we're writing this year with our writing implement. And then we're also going to, of course, need a book, the best book, the story of Jesus, the story of Jesus, which, another word for the Bible. So that's what you're gonna need as well. Hope everybody has one of those and reads from it every day. And then what else? Of course, of course, prayer. And maybe even have like a prayer journal, back to school prayer journal to write out your prayers to God. And then you can look back at them and see the ways that God has answered your prayers and our prayers together. Do I have anything else down in here? Oh yeah, here's what everybody has in the bottom of their knapsack. Some sweet treats to remind us that Jesus makes our life sweet. At this time, I'm gonna ask Isaiah to come and pray for us. And I'm gonna have all the kids gather because we're gonna go downstairs to have our own time of growing together. Kids, you can follow Patty out now if you want. <laughs> All right. And the rest of you, if you wouldn't mind, please joining with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are so good, and we adore you. You are merciful, compassionate, loving, and kind to us, Lord. And Lord, there are times, times in our lives where we feel like we don't deserve that kindness because we are sinful beings, but you say that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us and bring us back to righteousness in you. And I just pray, Lord, that as we stand here today, as we sit here, as we pray, that we would be confessing our sins, lifting them up to you, and asking for your forgiveness to take them away from us, Lord. And in this new season, Lord, we are so thankful for, for so many things, for the harvest season, for our friends and for our family, for school as it starts up, and, or has already started up, depending on. Yeah, we are thankful for your many good and gracious gifts to us, Lord. And finally, I just want to pray for Lee Fast and her family as they are mourning the loss of their brother, Fred. And I just pray that you would lift up the family uh, in peace and surround them with your love and your mercy and that they would just feel your presence, Lord. That, that you would be made known to them and that they would find security and peace and comfort in your loving arms. And for anyone else, Lord, who is hurting, whether it be a physical, a mental, or emotional hurt, Lord, we just ask that you would be with them, that we would all come around side those who are hurting and support them and love them and show them your goodness, your love, your mercy. And I pray for all of our hearts, Lord, as we are being prepared for the message that you have for us today, that our hearts be softened, our ears be opened, 
and that as we leave today, going out into our week, we would be a people who seek to do your will, seek after your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, the news of late on both sides of the border, here in North America anyway, is filled with people who are voicing outrage at how the federal governments have not lived up to the pledges they made, uh, what they said they were going to deliver if they were elected. I know there's multiple promises that candidates make in the hope that they can grow their base. The bottom line is they're trying to increase the size of the crowd that is following them. So as we think about that, as we think about politicians sort of declaring what they're going to do or not do so that the crowd increases, now imagine for a moment what it would sound like if someone is trying to run for political office and has this kind of platform. I stand for you losing your homes and families. If you vote for me, you will lose them. Let's talk about taxes. I am going to raise taxes to the point where you're going to lose everything. Everything you love. Are you with me? Pretty clear at that moment that that political leader is not going to go very far. I think they would be ending their campaign pretty swiftly. But when we look at Jesus' words as he's calling his followers, that's exactly what he did. As the number of people grew following him, he turns up the commitment level to the point where it seems offensive almost. And this morning we're going to begin a series for the month of September looking at some of the challenging words that Jesus spoke. And as we look at these sayings that Jesus had or teachings and we wrestle with them, I hope that we will deepen our relationship with Jesus as we try to make sense of what he's saying and in turn our faith and trust of who he is and what he has for us. So we're going to be in Luke's gospel and this morning we're in Luke chapter 14 and I'm going to read verses 25 to 33. You can remain seated as I read. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men <clears throat> to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Wow. As we hear these words Jesus speaks, we can feel confused, at least on the face of it. <clears throat> I mean, isn't this the one? Jesus is the one that talked about being loving? When he was asked the question, you know, rabbi, teacher, you know, what is the greatest commandments out of all the list of the commandments that are given to us? Jesus' answer to that person is to say, love God. Love God with all of who you are and love your neighbor as yourself. And then when asked that question, because you remember some of you might know the story of the lawyer the one that understands the law wanted to quibble a bit to say, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus basically tells another lesson that says, your neighbor is anyone around you. Even people that you might consider to be your enemies, 
That's your neighbor, that's your neighbor, that's your neighbor. So love everyone. So how is it that this teacher that talks about loving God and others and talks about loving a great and loving God is now turning to us and saying, okay, you need to hate your father. You need to hate your mother. He's saying, I should hate my wife, I should hate my children. Not only that, I'm supposed to hate my brothers and sisters. I'm going to hate my own life even. That seems a little bizarre. Maybe you're wrestling and, and asking the question, what's going on here? Why is Jesus calling us to hate? Wouldn't it have been better if Jesus said things that, you know, because we do have an easy time of hating things, right? We talk about, well, maybe it would have been better if Jesus said, okay, I want you to hate mosquitoes. I get it, Jesus. Yes, hate mosquitoes. Or hate raisins. I get it, Jesus. I get it. Some of you are wondering, what? Maybe that's just a me thing. Or hate potholes. For those of us who live in Moose Jaw, oh yeah, a few heads are nodding. In Moose Jaw, we're learning that, right? There's just a lot more things that we could add to say, well, that would have been more sense to hate those things. But this is a strange list. And besides, it's seeming to contradict Jesus' teaching, isn't it? Jesus, aren't you the one that said, we're to forgive others? And when you taught us to pray, you talked about, you know, asking God's forgiveness as we forgive others. And you, you talk about forgiving not just once, but over and over. There was something about 70 times 7, Jesus. You say to forgive, to exercise that way. Help us out. What are you saying here as you talk to us and you say, hate. But Jesus is trying to help us out. See, for the Jewish people, they have given some of their heart to the Lord Almighty, for sure. It's kind of like the person that says, you know, I want to take a trip and, and, and does it, and then when asked to say, okay, now you got to uh, fork out the money for the flight to go there, and then suddenly their heart is kind of pulled back. And the Jewish people said they've loved God, but they haven't given him their whole heart. And they've loved other things as well. In fact, more than they've loved God. As Pastor Andrew talked about God's message through the prophet Jeremiah last week, he said that Israel had in fact uh, moved to nothing more than things that were called crack cisterns, God's message said. That's only robbing them of life and joy. The life and joy that a loving almighty God has offered. So how do we make sense of it? When we look to God's word, we need to understand it through other parts of God's word. And so the clue for us in this passage, as Luke describes it for us, is that very first verse. Where Jesus turns and he sees the large crowds following him. They're there with him. And then we have to stop and say, okay, in the context of this gospel, what is Jesus doing? Well, Jesus is on a journey. Jesus is heading somewhere. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And the mission that Jesus has in this case is to save humanity. And the road that he's on is leading through suffering and it's leading to the cross. It's not a road that's easy. And Jesus has told those around him about the kingdom of God. In fact, just a few verses earlier, we learn as Jesus is at the home of somebody, a Pharisee, and the, the table is spread, he starts to do some teaching there, and he tells the parable of a great banquet to describe what God is like. And he says, God is like this man who invited people to a banquet. Now, when you hear banquet in your mind, I want you to remove from your thinking this idea of, you know, like a funeral banquet. It's not like that at all. It wasn't finger foods and sandwiches. We're talking about this wonderful spread of food. One of those banquets where you go to and you eat the food and you just keep thinking about it after that. 
Tracy and I, when we were on holidays, stopped at a restaurant in Medicine Hat, and we still think about that dinner. Woo-wee, that was good. That's the kind of banquet Jesus is saying that the man invited people to. One that goes down in history as the most glorious party with the most delectable foods. So what would be the response of people that received the invitation? Jesus said the response was those guests that were invited said, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. I got stuff to do. You know, I just bought this stuff. I got a field. I bought a cow. I got married. I know, I know, there's lots of jokes about that in the song, right? You all know that song, some of you, about, you know, I cannot come to the banquet. Should we sing that one in worship? (laughs) For those of you that are a little older, that is this lesson of this banquet invitation. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't bother me now. Well, that's what they've done. I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass on the invitation because there are other things more important. Time with you, God in relationship with you. So, Jesus then, as he's journeying to Jerusalem, turns and sees crowds of people uh, that are following him, and he's wanting to help them understand. Do you know what you're in for? You're wanting to be my disciple, and I want you to follow me, for sure. But I'm not going to play games, and I'm not going to do a bait-and-switch And so he turns to them and he says, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Now, right here, Jesus is not talking about the emotion of hate. He's talking about those things we prioritize. So as we hear his words, if you don't hate, what he's saying, if you love anything more than me, more than God, then you cannot be my disciple. It just doesn't work that way, Jesus says. The reality of what it means to be a follower of mine, to live for the kingdom of God, to make this journey with me, is nothing else can come before Unless you hate your father and your mother and your, your wife, your spouse, your children, your brothers and sisters, unless I come first and they're less. Now, Jesus is talking to predominantly Jewish people and for the Jewish people, the children of God, their families, their immediate relationships have become prized beyond their relationships with God because what's happened is that covenant that God had with Abraham saying you're going to be the father of many nations that's the Jewish people I've chosen you you're special and so what's happened is God's word of promise to say you're special has become this badge of honor to say I'm better than everybody God thinks I'm special it's kind of like if you've seen siblings if you have siblings Did you ever argue about who mom or dad loved more, right? Parents never do that. They don't have a favorite child. They love each one equally. Okay, let me just say. So for the people of Israel, they said, God, Father, thinks I'm special. You're not. Families become important to them. Their national pride has in fact surpassed really the love of the one that's saying you're special. So unless you put God first, Jesus says, you're not following the way you should. Then Jesus talks about this tower in verse 28. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete this building project? Now, within the collective consciousness of the the people of Israel, the Jewish people that are following him, there are a couple of images connected to this idea of a tower because a tower, Bible scholars will tell us, was often put in a vineyard. And a tower was built in a vineyard. Why? To what end? Well, in the bottom of the tower, it was wide enough that the workers could, in fact, dwell there and live there and do the work that they needed to, but also find housing. 
and then it went up high enough that those workers then had view of the vineyard. Why did they need the view of the vineyard? Because they wanted to protect the fruit and the work that they had done. And so if people came in to try to steal stuff, that tower was then there to serve as a watch place, to protect all that vineyard. The other part of it is this, is that within the prophecies of the Old Testament, especially in the book of Isaiah, there were so many comparisons to the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and being God's special vineyard. So there's this connection to say, you're going to build a tower to protect the community, the people of Israel. But if you don't consider what you have, then how far is that going to go? There's this other piece that's happening in the moment of Jesus speaking the lesson is that within the Jewish faith community, they think about the temple. Because if you think about the vineyard, God's people, where do God's people worship God? They go to the temple. And in Jesus' time, Herod the Great, just prior to Jesus' time, had this, this, uh, started this project of rebuilding the temple. Why? So he could glorify God? Mm, no, it was about Herod's glory for himself. And Herod then passed on because he died. Herod the Great didn't complete the work, but he passed on the work to his kids so that that temple could be completed. And Jesus also knows that the work of the temple didn't end up getting completed at all. In fact, the temple was destroyed. So this idea of family and this idea of tower for the Jewish people is steeped in their consciousness. Would you not consider, Jesus says, that can you finish the work? And to what end is it going to, going to give you? And then Jesus shifts now, talking about a king going off to war against another king. And he does this math. He says, you know, that king sees he has 10,000 soldiers and the other king has 20,000. Now that should be a wake-up call. You're not going to win that battle. The Jewish people had long held this idea that they were going to throw off their oppressors they're foreign oppressors. And now the mighty Roman Empire, who is far greater numbers than Israel could ever have. That if Israel goes to war against Rome, there is no way they're going to win that war. And so Jesus says, wouldn't you then send a delegation and bring about some kind of peace talks? Jesus is revealing to his followers that their agendas, their plans, their things that they hope for, the things that they love, that's not going to lead them to a good life. And so speaking the truth, you know, as we read these words, we maybe see Jesus as someone that is being harsh and cruel. That's not the case. Think of it more like this. N.T. Wright describes it this way. He says, it's like Jesus is the kind of leader that is about to set off on a great expedition to rescue some people. And they're going to head up the mountain pass to bring about urgent medical aid to those who need it to live. And Jesus is saying, he's telling his followers, if we're going to make it there, you cannot take everything. You're going to have to leave some things so that we can live through this and then help people. This path is just too steep for the rest of those things. It's too dangerous a road that we're embarking on. Jesus talks about, unless you take up your cross and follow me. And at this moment, he hasn't told the disciples, all of them yet, the followers about the cross that he faces. He's just using it because the Romans had used the cross as, an, as a torture tool to kill those that were against Rome. So that within their consciousness, they would have seen crosses and understood. Unless you lay down your life. Okay, this all may seem discouraging. Let's just take a breath. Whew. Wow. Jesus, these words are hard. 
maybe you're feeling blindsided and you're, and you're knocked out and about. But remember, this is Jesus. And he's teaching us about God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And I want to say this morning, there's this strange formula that the world's calculations don't really tell us, right? I've used the phrase before, there's kind of this God math. We, we kind of are taught by the world that, you know what, you need to seek your, your own good for yourself, seeking all that you want to bring about everything good. Oh, if you just kind of take these positive thoughts about your life and put that out into the universe, then that good will come back to you. And Jesus says, <laughs> your will and your agenda and the things that you think you love, that's not how it works. See, whoever wants to follow me to be my disciple, to find that abundant life. I love the way Eugene Peterson uh, paraphrased it in the message. To find that life, that more life than you could live on your own life. If you want to find that life, then this offering up and denying themselves and taking up your cross daily. If you set about to live your own life trying to save yourself, to love your father and mother, your wife, your husband, your children, your brothers and sisters in your own strength and by your own power, living for yourself, Jesus says you end up losing it. But when you lay down your life, when you give it all to me, and I give you my love. There's no reserve in God's love. It's far greater. And it's eternal. And I give you my love to then love others with. I love, C.S. Lewis spoke of it this way. He said, when I've learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense and instead of God, I shall be moving toward a state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed but increased. That's a huge statement. That's the God math that C.S. Lewis then exposes. When we lay down our lives and give them to God and say, I trust you. I die to myself and I give all of who I am to you. Then Jesus says, then God will increase it. And we think we're going to lose out. Oh, don't put self first, put someone else first. You're going to lose. What are you thinking? Ah, but that's, Jesus says, that's how life is truly found, is to live for God. In Christ's love, with his life in us, we can then love the way he loves. As you hear these words this morning, and it gives us pause, right? And we should ask ourselves, you know, have I put my agenda, my desires, all those things I love above God? As we think about our lives and we think about trying to love others around us in our own strength, I don't know about you, but how quickly do you find you end up coming to the limit of how far you can love. And you realize, oh, I said I was going to love more and more and more, but I, I reached the end. And Jesus is saying to his followers, you know what? Unless you love 
me more than them, then you won't really love at all. Maybe that's shocking to you, but I want to encourage you this morning. Jesus' words are, in fact, hopeful. This isn't a bait and switch. He's honest with us to say, as we lay down our lives, as we love God more, then that love that God has for us will be placed in us and it'll flow through us. And let's hear those words of Jesus and trust him with all that we have and all that we are and see love for others increase. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we think about this passage of teaching of yours, Jesus, as we think about the challenge, it's a bit shocking to us. And then as we understand, Jesus, where you're headed, it's a bit jarring in the fact that we have gotten it so wrong. So God, I pray that you would help us, each one, to receive the truth. Holy Spirit, give us the heart to receive it and then the strength to live it out. And where we might wrestle with the, the trusting aspect of this God math, that you would help us as we count the cost to have the faith because we recognize that our faith is limited. So God, give us more to trust you, the strength to, to live this out. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we sing our closing song this morning? Love is breaking through, and the 
Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Oh, lay your burdens down. Oh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door. Is any welcome anymore? Father's house, oh, lay your burdens down. Oh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Oh, you're in the Father's house. Now receive the benediction, the good word. Now may the Lord Jesus look on us with his amazing grace and watch over us with his great love and surround us with his peace that passes all understanding. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for coming.